Hi, everyone. Welcome to this panel on the Kiss the Ground film. We're so extremely excited for everyone to be here today. Um, and thanks so much to Ryland, Rebecca, and Josh for, for being here with us. We're really excited to, to learn from you. Thanks for having us. We're excited to be here. We love to see our club. So it's really an honor to be in this conversation with you. And this is, uh, this is Likewise. just so- Thank you. And it's such a great link to your film. I've just recently watched it again myself. And I think it has a, a message that really appeals to so many people. I know I've, I've been at my, my bank or the grocery store and happened to start a conversation about this film and people have been so enthusiastic. That's great. I you love must, hearing that. You That's must great. have a, a great bank and a great grocery store. <laughs> I guess I'm lucky that way. Um, but I think this is a message that really can appeal to so many people. And, and we're seeing that with, with such a huge amount of interest in this panel. Wonderful. Well, and we're well. also joined by Ramon. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Ramon now. Thank you. All right. Can everybody hear me? Yes. yes. Right. Okay. Thanks so much. Uh, and sorry for being a, a minute late uh, or two. You know, I was in this other panel with uh, Jane Fonda and Randy Weingarten, oh. and, uh, and it was uh, very exciting. You know, all the momentum that it's happening in the in the country right now. You know, and uh, it's amazing that uh, that you know the president uh, with just fifty days, you know, passed uh, signed. Uh, uh, the biggest relief package, you know, in, in almost a century. So, uh, so very exciting things uh, happening. And so welcome everyone. Uh, you know, it's, it's great to, to be here with all of you today. And um, I know that, uh, you know, there are other events happening right now at the moment. That, so we appreciate your commitment to this topic and we're very excited to to have you, you know, thanks so much for coming together. I don't know if in the uh, in the minute before I, I was introduced, but I'm I'm Ramon Cruz. Uh, I use pronouns see him his, uh, and I am uh, the president of the Sierra Club, which is the uh, nation's uh, largest uh, grassroots environmental organization uh, with uh, nearly four million people and. Um, uh, 64 chapters around the nation, you know. So, uh, so very excited to 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 be here. Of course, uh, I'm speaking to with you today from uh, the occupied territory of the Canarsi people, otherwise known as Brooklyn, New York. Although I'm originally from uh, Boriquen, which is the uh, the Taino name for the island of Puerto Rico. And uh, so, again, thanks so much for for coming together for this panel discussion on agriculture and the regenerative uh, movement, you know, and for some time now, the Sierra Club has focused on, on how uh, regenerative agriculture can reverse climate change and improve people's health. And uh, our current uh, food system is a top contributor to greenhouse gases and, and has led to, to rising rates of obesity and diabetes and cancer and other health problems, you know, particularly among marginalized communities and communities of color and, and uh, indigenous people. And, and to change, we need everyone to engage. And, and in particular, we must address these considerable inequities uh, in order to get there, right? So I hope everyone's had a chance to to watch the Kiss the Ground film. I, I watched it uh, recently and I, I was uh, amazed by it. I, I learned so much. And sometimes, you know, when you're in, in your field, you think you know uh, many things and you have been exposed to many. And I, I thank you all so much for, for making this film and carrying this message forward. I hope all of you that have seen it, you have enjoyed it. If not, you should definitely do that as soon as we finish tonight. And, uh, and we're really looking forward uh, you know, to, to talking about some of the topics in, in that Kiss the Ground uh, has brought up and uh, you know, including how we can farm more regeneratively and, and where we can go from here. You know, I, 
I must say that I was uh, today. We have uh, we hit nearly 70 um, 70 percent uh, degrees in Brooklyn, and and uh, so I started uh, planting seeds, and I could not like uh, you know it's something that I do more or less every year in my backyard, but uh, but I, I couldn't not think stop thinking about everything I saw in that film. So. Thank you so much. And, you know, so I will introduce the, the panel briefly uh, so that we can get to the conversation, you know. So first, uh, Josh Tico uh, is the co-director of Kiss the Ground and has worked on environmental issues for over 20 years. And his directorial debut, debut, uh, debut <laughs> uh, was uh, the 2008 Sundance Audience Award winning documentary, Fuel. And on his side, we have Rebecca Tico. Um, he's also the co-director of Kiss the Ground film, as well as a producer and an environmental author and activist. She produced Fuel and co-director and produced The Big Fix and official selection of the 2011 Cannes Film Festival, her directorial debut. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's uh, my apologies. You know, I uh, still think in uh, Spanish in many uh, in many cases. So, uh, but yeah, he's uh, so um, so the her the boot was uh, the critical acclaimed documentary Pump. So we have also Rylan Engelhardt uh, is the co-founder and executive director of Kiss the Ground. He's an entrepreneur, an activist, and the co-creator of the award-winning documentary, May I Be Frank. He is also the host of Kiss the Ground's podcast. And then we're also going to hear from Mary Chambers. He's the chair of the Sierra Club California Sustainable Agriculture Committee. She earned her um, MS in Sustainable Agriculture from Stanford University and most recently worked as a technical specialist uh, for agricultural markets in IDE in Bangladesh. Uh, so we do have a lot of questions for the first 30 minutes. We'll be discussing some of these questions that were submitted ahead of, the, of time to the panel. And during the last 30 minutes, uh, we'll open up the discussion to audience questions. So I would like to start first with uh, Josh and Rebecca. Uh, can you please tell us, uh, you know, what was the inspiration behind this beautiful film that you have created? You know, uh, well, Ryland was part of it. He was he was one of the instigators. Um, and, you know, we've made films. This Kiss the Ground is our 14th environmental documentary film. We have made four films about oil. And right about the time that we were moving out of Venice Beach and Ryland was moving into our old place, he was like, you've got to, you've got to learn about soil and sequestration and drawdown. And we were like, okay, Ryland, you know, he's like, no, you don't understand. Like soil can store all of the carbon that we've put in the atmosphere. And we thought the only thing harder than making three films about oil interesting would be making a film about soil interesting. You know, there's that expression about boring as dirt. So it was definitely kind of a confronting at first an idea of making this film. But then as we started to sort of dig deeper, so to speak, um, you know, as two people who are really concerned with climate change and really committed to the earth, we started to see huge promise and just kind of like groundbreaking science about what the actual potential is here and a real pathway for how to reverse climate change we realized that this had to be the subject of our next film. And not only could it not be boring, it had to be really good because the information is so important. And that's why we've spent the last seven years working on Kiss the Ground. Josh, you wanna add something? I, look, I just, I'm excited to, uh, that we've got all, all of these wonderful audience members from all over the country. It looks like we've got people from Florida, New York, California, New Mexico, uh, just all over. And so welcome everybody. For, thanks for taking the time. You watch the movie. Presumably, if you haven't watched the movie, you go watch the movie after this. Thanks, thanks for taking the time to spend with us this evening. I, look, I think the major inspiration for this film is very simple. You know, every degraded 
ecosystem that we see on earth can be regenerated, it can be restored. And so the promise or the hope for a planet that is in a state of restoration rather than a state of desecration is huge because there is no other way that we're gonna sustain 10, 11, 12 billion people on this planet other than regeneration. There's, there's only one pathway for it. So you can't be for conservation and against regeneration. You can't be for ecology and against regeneration. It just doesn't make sense. This is really the new um, codification of the deep green ecology movement that has been happening since the late 1960s. And I think it's a powerful recodification. It's, a, it's an intersectional movement. It's a diverse movement. Ultimately, it is a movement about restoring what once was using the best that we have of native understanding, the best that we have of technology and combining them. And that's, that's a bright future for all of us to live into. So I think the ultimate inspiration for us, we have two children, four years old, seven years old, you know, the ultimate, you know, 6.9, she's going to be seven in a couple of days. The, <laughs> the ultimate inspiration is, wouldn't it be amazing if rather than saying, I'm sorry to our children, we could say, isn't this great? We are co-creating a restorational planet, a restorational economy, a restorational time for human humanity. And I, that's what I, we've always loved about the Sierra Club, the commitment to beautiful green Mother Earth, you know, and, and all of the blue parts too. So it's, it's wonderful to be here with you. Uh, we're inspired by the great work Sierra Club's doing and, and uh, I'm excited that so many people are inspired by the film. Thanks so much, uh, Josh and Rebecca, certainly. And, uh, and again, thanks everybody that, uh, you know, that are tuned in. Apparently we have, uh, you know, right now over 250, 300 people uh, from all over the nation and uh, you know we're competing against uh, the president so uh, that's quite remarkable even though we want him to succeed succeed in every capacity uh, but uh, but yeah turning now to you uh, Ryland uh, you know could you tell us a bit uh, about the Kiss the ground organization and and you know how it started goals mission etc yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, so as, as Rebecca shared, uh, I moved into their house in Venice uh, after a trip to New Zealand. And um, yeah, I, I had watched a panel called Can Human Beings Sustain Themselves on Planet Earth? And five out of the six experts said no. And one expert said, if we could think and understand um, as part of nature, and we could understand that photosynthesis and that the way our atmosphere and the way our world um, has created an environment where life can thrive, we could actually regenerate and actually take the problem of carbon in our atmosphere causing climate change and turn it into the solution of making carbon rich soils under our feet. And that moment, for whatever reason, you never know what moment will change your life. That moment changed my life where I could see how life could be existing seven generations forward for the first time ever. Because up until that moment was like um, a slow, you know, slowly going off the cliff. And, you know, to really get regeneration in my bones in that moment, I really got, wow, this is the most compelling, inspiring um, possibility that I've ever come across. And so literally in Josh and Rebecca's living room, I started gathering people as a volunteer group. Um, and really the mission was, how can we awaken the message and the understanding of regeneration to a global capacity? And, um, you know, we, we were in Los Angeles. We thought, well, media is probably the best way that we can do that through building awareness. And um, we started an, an organization called Kiss the Ground. Um, and quite shortly after there, um, had the opportunity of, you know, partnering with Josh and Rebecca um, in a seven-year journey of making that film. Um, but as an organization, we, yeah, we have um, four primary programs. Uh, we started off as a storytelling uh, media organization creating, we've created over 60 short films that tell stories of regeneration. Um, and then we have a, a stewardship or an education program where we create online courses for really building 
um, a cavalry of people who can get this story and this understanding in their bones so that they can be wherever they are in the world can really be powerful communicators and advocates for this regenerative movement. Um, so we have courses that we can empower people to be advocates for the regenerative movement. And then uh, our third program is our farmland program where we um, provide scholarships, mentorship, and soil testing for farmers so that they can make the transition to regenerative agriculture. And then our fourth program is uh, working to convene policy leaders and experts to move policy to support uh, regenerative agriculture. And uh, yeah, and it's, it's a real honor to be here and I'm grateful for the Sierra Club really championing uh, the message and the movement of regeneration. So thank you. Great, thanks a lot, uh, Rylan. So, um, so now turning into, uh, to, to Rebecca, uh, you know, the film is basically a, an 84 minute glimpse into regenerative uh, agriculture in the United States, uh, but this is only, it is only a small part of the story, you know, so I wonder what, what are other components and stories do you, that you think are important to the narrative of regenerative agriculture and practices? I mean, I think for us, our focus really has been about um, conveying the basic information in a compelling way. So putting, you know, telling the story of carbon in the atmosphere is sound is, is pretty challenging to do, especially when you're talking about something that's invisible, you can't really see it. And, you know, we think of it as this terrible thing that we want to go to war against, and we don't realize that we are carbon. So having people sort of be entertained and tell these personal stories of heroes who are out there working to bring regenerative agriculture to life, um, you know, that was definitely the, the mode for how we were going to convey it. But really, our goal was to have reach a tipping point with the basic understanding of what drawdown is. Most people hadn't heard of bio sequestration into healthy soil as a solution for how to get um, back down to where we want to be with carbon in the atmosphere and carbon in our oceans, um, CO2. So I think, um, you know, it was a challenging story to tell because it's a story that's coalescing and has been coalescing as we've been telling the story over the last seven years. And certainly we draw from all of these different cultures and practices that have been around for a long time, but never have we looked at it through the lens of specifically what's not working in America right now with our food system and what practices can we put into place as a humanity to reverse the desertification that we're experiencing on a global level for the first time. Like two thirds of the earth is desertifying. And so um, it's people are so shut down around the, the doom and gloom of climate change and it makes people paralyzed. So you can't start off telling a story with people who aren't listening or who are too scared to even hear the information that you wanna tell. So for us, the storytelling has been finding people who are inspirational, um, looking at what doesn't work, and then also um, weaving the doom and gloom, terrible news, which there's a lot of it, with the threads of hope, which also there's a lot of, and to the point where people get the gravity, they don't shut down, but also take action. And so it's been hard. I mean, I think we're getting more into the, the storytelling and the personal journeys, you know, in our next projects. This really for us was how do we convey the basic principles on a global scale and looking at the U.S. in the last seven years, what doesn't work? And, you know, just for background, my family, I'm the seventh generation of a farming family from the Midwest. And so I'll be the first one to tell you that that system is broken and that that system doesn't work and that we can do better. And I think that's for me personally, in addition to our kids, what, what motivated us. But, you know, I think that there are thousands of stories for people to tell around this that people haven't heard yet, that we haven't even heard yet, because this movement is happening right now. And we're seeing it, you know, explode. And this is a moment where people have reached the tipping point of this basic understanding. And we can now really start to sort of dance in all of the nuances of what's possible. Great, thanks. Uh... Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Rylan, uh, you know, these practices and philosophies that, you know, that Rebecca is talking about, uh, it, you know, are not new by any means. Uh, you know, indigenous peoples have been living on this land since time immemorial and, and only relatively recently in history has agriculture become unsustainable. 
Uh, so can you speak a little bit uh, more about what people were doing to grow or obtain food before the industrialization of agriculture? Yeah, I mean, that's a huge, that's a, there could be a, our whole, our whole, our whole conversation could be around that. Um, but, you know, what I do know or what I do understand is that, um, you know, I think the way we view the world obviously shapes the physical reality of the world. And I think um, we've become as a civilization much less connected to the earth and to the living, breathing mother, the body of mother earth. And so, you know, what I know is that many and most indigenous cultures lived in a much more uh, relationship of reciprocity um, and understanding and much more attunement to their environment, their place that they have lived and continue to live. Um, so in that way, the philosophy of regenerative agriculture which really is, you know, how do we be um, supportive and attuned and adapting to this living system and supporting it to be um, continuing to be productive and uh, regenerating. Um, so I, I definitely know that there's, you know, in, in California, there's obviously the tending the wild, there was indigenous cultures that were, you know, had a lot of practices that were, um, you know, helping restore and create um, a very biodiverse, um, you know, ecosystem tapestry of life. Um, but I also do know that, you know, since the beginning of time, you know, 10,000 years ago, since the beginning of agriculture, there's been, you know, cultures that have been degrading ecosystems, you know, such as like, you know, the, I, I, you know, the, the base of Chinese civilization, you know, eroded, you know, the, the loose plateau, which is in the film, or the fertile crescent, you know, was, you know, used to be fertile and was destroyed. So I, I know that there's been, you know, many indigenous cultures that have really gotten this. Um, and then I think there's been many cultures that, you know, have grown their populations um, and their populations couldn't um, sustain that living ecosystem. And so I think we're reckoning with that at a, at a global scale of, are we, you know, as Josh said, can we use the, 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 the most, you know, the best historical wisdom of indigenous thinking combined with, you know, science and technology of this moment so that we can, um, you know, save this precious planet that we're all living on. So that, that's, that's, my, that's my answer of this now moment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Ryland. Uh, Josh, you know, th there are many questions related to the incorporation of animals into farming systems and, you know, which is a very sensitive topic, you know, and the film speaks to it, you know, can you please elaborate on this topic? And of course, you know, whoever else wants to, uh, to join Ryland as well, but yeah. Yeah, please. Well, I, look, I think, I think it's a sensitive topic in terms of personal choice, you know, what we choose to eat. The film doesn't preach and nor do we preach about what somebody should or shouldn't have their own personal dietary choices be. I think that's a personal decision. Uh, logistically speaking, two thirds of the planet does not have sufficient rainfall to sustain tree cover at this point. So you've got two thirds of the planet that's been degraded by human agriculture over the past 10,000 years. You gotta understand agriculture is a 10,000 year old story. It began in the Fertile Crescent. And as humanity moved out, so did the story of agriculture. It's always the same story. We build, we build empires, the population increases, and then the resource base implodes because we degrade the soil. So this has happened to 23 civilizations and we're the, we're the biggest experiment. We're doing the experiment on a global scale. And we're the first, this is the first moment where we have the reverse, the ability to hit the reverse switch. We can literally reverse the experiment. So given the fact that we've deteriorated over 70% of the world's topsoil, given the fact that we've done most of that in a very short period of time, we now have a choice to make. We can begin to regenerate that topsoil and with it, the ecosystems. We know from ecosystemic studies that you can regenerate an ecosystem much of the microbiome remains intact, it's dormant. It's stored in the sand. Even if the, even if the soil is degraded to silica, you can restore it because the biota 
is, is quiet. It's literally much of the microorganisms still exist, but they are not activated until they're in an aqueous solution, until they're in water. So how do you bring water to two thirds of the planet's soil without sufficient rainfall? And the answer is simple, tall grasses. It's what existed prior to us denuding the land. That's what existed in the Great Plains of America, for instance. And how do you sustain tall grasses? Because if you grow a tall grass, it will oxidize within a year or two. It won't stay, right? So there's a natural cycle. And nowhere in nature do you find plants alone. Everywhere you find plants and animals. And the natural cycle is tall grasses grow, animals graze those tall grasses. They move in herds very quickly. The tall grasses, when they're pulled, the root structure gets pulled. It incentivizes new growth. The tops are cut, the grass grows again. It's a yearly cycle. So there is no other known way to restore two thirds of the planet other than to herd hooved herding herbivores, grazers across the land. And we don't do it like we do it today. We don't do it, we don't put them in animal feedlots, those horrible things that are immoral and unhealthy and should be outlawed everywhere, including the United States. We do it by moving animals in packs as, as predators would. Now in every major experiment that's been done from Australia to the United States, across Europe and Africa, we see higher levels of sequestered carbon, sustained tall grasses and renewed ecosystems. Well, that's what regeneration is. So there is really no way to do regeneration on a large scale without herbivores, without cows and bison, the very similar creatures that used to exist in those locations before humanity decided it was a good idea to destroy the entire ecosystem of those areas. So I think on one level, look, yes, people should eat what they wanna eat in terms of their own personal choices. On another level, we have mountains of empirical peer reviewed studies and evidence that suggest there is no technological fix we can't plant 3 trillion trees to replace the 3 trillion trees we've taken before we restore the basic ecosystem functions of two thirds of the planet. How do we do that? We do that with ruminants. And that's not a sensitive issue. That's what existed before we had so many human beings destroying so much ecosystem. So we, we aren't talking about a new system. We're talking about the original system. We're just saying, in order to make that original system work with highways and freeways and states and borders and all of the infrastructure that humanity has created, it's going to require management. It's gonna require oversight. It's gonna require human intervention. It took human intervention to make the mess that we're in and it's gonna take human intervention to fix it, but it's also gonna take things with four legs. And that's what nature made. It, made. it made creatures that would restore the land. It's time to us for us to walk, walk and work cooperatively with those creatures and not pretend that human beings are, are above them or somehow we're separate from them. It's, it's all part of the ecosystem. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Josh, for that explanation. Yeah, it was very impressive in that, in the documentary when you saw everywhere where the bison used to roam and, uh, and you know, how much uh, we have depleted that, you know, and that was the natural fertilizer and uh, yeah so again thanks so much for for everything that uh, that you taught us in the in that film um, now uh, turning uh, to Mary that uh, that uh, hasn't spoken yet you know I wanted to ask you Mary uh, how does regenerative agriculture compare to other climate mitigation solutions in terms of of its scale and and its attractiveness Sure, so I'm very honored to be on the panel with everyone and happy to answer that. I would say there's a couple of things that makes regenerative agriculture a particularly attractive solution among other climate mitigation solutions. It has um, really a lot of co-benefits so um, compared to how, how few downsides it has. So it can offer improved farm productivity, um, less use of water, less use of energy, less um, chemical inputs that can degrade and harm surrounding ecosystems in various ways. And that all means that it can contribute to the protection of biodiversity, the protection of water quality and so on. Um, some of the techniques of regenerative agriculture can even actively provide habitat for animals and native plants. For example, the use of trees or the use of uh, plant habitats for native insects. 
it's also potentially um, helpful in from a social perspective. So diverse cropping managed on a smaller, more sustainable scale can help farmers become more economically stable compared to just growing a single crop whose price is controlled by large um, agribusiness monopolies. And when they have a more diversified farm system, farmers are often able to provide more stable employment for the people who work on those farms. So there's a social aspect to regenerative practice as well that makes it attractive as a, as a climate solution. And then it's based on you know, relatively affordable, relatively uncomplicated technology. A lot of carbon sequestration technology that's coming on looking really promising is pretty complex and it can be very, very expensive. Whereas regenerative farming is relatively very low cost. Um, you know, sequestering carbon in the soil, depending on the context, could be as low as like maybe ten dollars per ton of CO two equivalent. Um, you know, depending of course on the on the context. The scale is um, still kind of something that's being figured out by researchers, and it depends a lot on the decisions that humans make in terms of policy, uh, in terms of consumption choices, and so on. Um, one estimate that I've seen that I like is that a reasonable upscaling of regenerative ag and conservation techniques in the U.S. might allow us to be offsetting around half of the GHG footprint of agriculture by 2050, but this could be a lot larger depending on um, policy decisions. Of course, it could be smaller depending on those decisions as well, which is why we have to advocate for um, an aggressive pursuit of this approach. So the way I like to think of regenerative agriculture is as a really important tool in a really important toolbox. Um, it needs to come along with things like decarbonizing our energy system, better access to public transportation, and all those other tools that are that are so important in the fight against climate change. Uh, but it's it's a very attractive tool in this extremely crucial toolbox. All right. Thanks a lot, Mary. Um, Okay, so I mean, since I promised people that uh, you know after half hour we were going to switch to uh, questions from the audience, I do have uh, more questions that I would be interested in uh, all of you to to respond. But uh, let's see, I'll I'll get some of the questions from the audience. Uh, please, everybody, the over three hundred people uh, uh, connected uh, nationwide, please uh, write it down that we have. Uh, people and Alexander here, um, you know, sending uh, questions over. So, you know, one of them, uh, for example, how can people practice these concepts if they have a smaller property with perhaps just a garden or a lawn? Who wants to take that one? I mean, I think everybody in the last year has been starting, you know, a COVID garden if they have a little, even if it's in their window, because we're all craving nature so much. Um, but I think, you know, I think the idea is like if you can plant a perennial, if you can plant a fruit tree or something that will continuously grow food for you, that's the start. You know, if you can get a chicken or a few chickens and start to have your own eggs and, you know, start the process of growing food on your property and like getting connected again with where your food is coming from. Then you can even start to share goats with your neighbors if you can, or, you know, swap things with people. I mean, I think just getting back to our roots and understanding where our food comes from. I mean, kids not knowing where a carrot comes from, that's crazy. We have to get reconnected with how we as human beings live on this earth and where our food comes from and how our food is grown is an essential part of that. So. Um, you know, like just little things that people can do in their own backyard, you know, composting is a huge one, of course. Um, but I think the bigger question is the food system that's broken is not going to be fixed solely with people growing lemons in their backyard or whatever it is. You know, we really have to look at overall, where is our food coming from and what system am I supporting each time I'm putting food in my mouth? I'm not going to tell you what food it is that you should put in your mouth, but ask yourself the question, Am I regenerating the earth or am I degenerating the earth with this choice that I'm making, with this choice I'm feeding my family? Am I regenerating the earth? Am I helping to improve the quality in the soil, reverse desertification, you know, draw down carbon and store water in healthy soil? Or am I degrading soil, promoting desertification, and ultimately hurting the future? And that's a choice that each of us makes every single day, every time we put food in our mouth. Thank you, Rebecca. Ryland, I think you raised your hand. 
Do you want to add anything or anybody uh, else? I mean, Rebecca did it. Rebecca did a great job. Uh, yeah, I would say, yeah, very similarly, um, you know, the, I, the, the ability to create a garden and start being, yeah, connected to that, the life in our backyard, the life um, right here, we can tend to it, we can add value to it, we can actually create life by our participation with nature. And that's something that as a civilization that we've mostly, you know, as urbanites living in cities are, have been very disconnected from. And so, uh, you know, the idea of starting a regenerative victory garden, um, you know, is, you know, a, a new victory garden movement and creating a really understanding of how can we keep the soil covered? How can we, you know, as Rebecca said, you know, have perennials, uh, how can we make our compost that was food waste and turn that back into soil fertility that goes back into our, into our, into our soil. Um, and then, you know, the satisfaction and joy of being able to harvest food that we've grown and share that with our family or our neighbors, you know, again, there's just not much more satisfying than that. I, I, I recently heard uh, a statement that it said, if you want to be happy for a few hours, drink a bottle of whiskey. If you want to be happy for a few years, get married. But if you want to be happy for a lifetime, plant a garden. So yeah, I think it's a really, really, um, to, to, to know this bigger context that we're a part of, um, of supporting the regeneration of life by our little participation, um, even if it's just a very micro participation, it, it, it has us feel connected to a larger um, regeneration of life and supporting life on planet, planet Earth. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, no, certainly. And, uh, you know, as I was, uh, as I told you, you know, that I was uh, enjoying the garden today and of course, you know, recognizing of course the privilege of having a garden that I can plant uh, in. But, uh, but yeah, I, uh, again, the, the, the film kept coming back to me. And uh, as I was a, using, you know, bringing the, cutting the, whatever is left from last year, I remember, you know, that, uh, that whole part on the, on how the, the, um, the cows like just bite some of it and then leave the roots there. So I was uh, keeping all the roots then going back into the mix of, you know, with the compost uh, from this past year and everything. And, you know, again, kept coming back and, and uh, I hope that now I have the, the best soil that I have had in years because of the, of the film. Um, okay, continuing with uh, other uh, questions from the audience. There's one here, does, does the, uh, oh, sorry, Rylan. Yeah, just uh, again, because you, you asked the, the question Ma Mary was sharing, like the potential of regenerative agriculture and another beautiful um, quotation from uh, Richard Teague, um, put, it, put, a, put a paper out that um, calculated that regenerative agriculture can sequester 1.2 billion metric tons of um, carbon dioxide into its soils in North America alone, which would allow for uh, fifth, over 50% of to be mitigate and actually, um, yeah, would actually mitigate 50% of annual emissions that we're putting up each year. So that um, just in North America alone, regenerative agriculture could actually eliminate 50% of what we're, what we're currently releasing. Um, so just another, um, you know, compelling data point for the, the scale and possibility of regenerative agriculture as a solution. Thanks, all right, and then everybody take, take note of these numbers. Um, so um, the question, another question from the audience, does the organic matter in the soil that regenerative agriculture practices produce eventually break down and release carbon to the atmosphere? I think, what, I think we have to go back and look at a historical example of what background organic matter was in the United States and Europe um, over the Eurasian continent before industrialization versus what the average is today. In the US, we had background organic matter of anywhere from sort of 6% up to 14% organic matter. Um, today, you're lucky to find 4% in any given plot of soil. And so, you know, the bigger question is from a historical perspective, where was the carbon and where is the carbon now? 
And the answer is we had a tremendous quantity more carbon in the soil, and now we have tremendous quantity more carbon in the atmosphere. So we know that the soil is the largest available carbon sink on Earth. We can't put more in the oceans. No one's advocating for that. We can't put more in the atmosphere. No one's advocating for that. And aside from a few, you know, sort of Star Trekian techno wonder fixes, uh, none of which has proved any anywhere close to financially viable. Um, the only solution that people have come up with is to put less carbon in the atmosphere. Well, yes, that's a wonderful idea, but over time, that's that's a slow slope. You know, we're exceeding 400 parts per billion, and it's going up and up and up. And we know to have real sustainability on this planet, we don't need to be at 350. We need to be at 300. So how do we get there? How do we get there, barring some magical techno, you know, alien stardust fixed? Very simple. We do it the natural way. We put it back in the soil. Is there carbon that comes out of the soil? Yes, absolutely. It is a carbon flow. It's a carbon cycle. And we can measure the balance of carbon on a net net basis, on a yearly basis. When we degenerate soil, we lose carbon because we lose soil organic matter. When we lose soil organic matter, we lose the pump of carbon down into the recalcitrant layers of the soil. So if there are no long grasses, you know, a grass may be two, three, four, five feet even above ground, the depth of the roots is far greater. Those roots are a carbon pump. They're moving carbon from the topsoil, which is where soil organic matter is, down into the recalcitrant layers where it can stay for thousands of years. So yes, in a system in which you do not have a carbon pump, you do not have stable grasses pumping that carbon down, you will see a constant gain and loss of carbon. In a regenerative system where you've got tall grasses as well as trees, shrubs, bushes, and myriad of other flora and fauna interacting, you see a net net negative basis of carbon on a year end, on an annual basis every single time. That's how we know that this is a sequestering mechanism. But if we, stop, if we stop roaming ruminants on the land and we go back to the practices that we're doing today, then yes, that yep. soil organic yep. matter will turn back sure. to carbon and go back yep. up into the atmosphere. You're going to oxidize it and burn it off and it'll go right back up. But I mean, you know, we took the top, the topsoil of North America and we completely depleted it and we can turn that around and we can bring that mm. back up and, and just have, let's do it. Let's, let's have a foot of more of soil organic matter and find ways to keep that in the soil this time. Yeah, certainly. And I, I wonder if anybody else, Mary, do you want to also um, expand on, the, on this? Sure. Um, I, I would agree with everything that was previously said. And I'd also add that uh, kind of as, as Rebecca was saying, it really depends a lot on human management decisions. So whether that carbon is going to stay in the ground or leave, um, humans have a great deal of influence over that. And I, I think that's a scary thought, but it's also an exciting thought. Um, and I, I think it's a real opportunity to realize how much influence we have. Uh, if we make the right decisions, we can keep a lot of that carbon in the ground. Um, and there's more science coming out all the time around exactly what factors op will optimize for that. Um, but you know, if we make the wrong decisions, that carbon can just get up and leave again. And, and that's why we need a strong policy framework. We need strong peer-to-peer -peer farmer education um, so that these practices can continue on long into the future. Thank you, Mary. Um, now, uh, looking into other uh, questions, uh, for example, some several people have asked why there weren't more people of color, especially indigenous people in the movie. You know, if you have heard from that feedback before and how would you respond to that? I, I would add also, you know, when you when I saw the images of most of the farmers and how, you know, maybe in my own uh, thinking then or my experience is I was like, wow, this is like, you know, the, the, the constituents that probably voted, uh, you know, against their interest for the former president. And, uh, and you know, where are the farmers of, of color uh, that I'm sure, you know, many of them, especially 
uh, you know, when you have the, the, hor the horrible experience, you know, of uh, uh, slavery, but, you know, that was already in itself a corporate and often monocrop, but probably uh, there were also sustainable practices. So I'm sure there is experience from that. And, uh, and, and maybe this is also a, a moment to, if any of you know about the, you know, the Emergency Relief for Farmers of Color Act, and the Justice for Black Farmers Act, uh, you know, perhaps is also a good moment to to expand on it. Uh, so yeah, whoever wants to uh, to dive into uh, into this topic. Well, at the risk of being the white guy that talks about the uh, <laughs> the BIPOC, you know, farmer issue, um, you know, there I want to point out a, a a serious problem with agriculture in the United States, and that is the majority, the vast majority, over 95% of farmers and ranchers in this country are of a certain age, gender, and ethnicity. And specifically, average farmer in the US is 67, 68 years old and a white male. That's, that's by far the normative situation. Um, obviously, we got to that situation through all sorts of terrible colonialization and patriarchy and, and unacceptable behavior that we don't wanna, don't wanna perpetuate. But where we're at today, and we were just on a, an incredible uh, panel with Senator Cory Booker, who's putting forward that incredible piece of legislation to really begin to bring uh, black and indigenous farmers back into the fold. We have decimated our BIPOC farmer population uh, largely by um, largely by actions that that either disempowered or took land or or effectively uh, destroyed what was a very amazing farming knowledge base community and group of people. And today we have 3.4 million people, 3.4 million people involved in agriculture in the U.S. 45,000 of them are black farmers. Now that's just a travesty. It's it's completely unacceptable. And so look, could Kiss the Ground have been uh, more diverse? Yes, absolutely. And this is an issue we're tackling in our, in our upcoming projects, our upcoming films. Um, but I also think people discredit the diversity that is there um, because it doesn't always look the way you think it should look. You know, Ray Archuleta, he's perhaps one of the main characters, the first person you meet in the movie. Uh, Ray is Native American and Latinx. And he is one of the main voices in the film. Um, so we do have those incredible, important voices. And I think everyone who's involved in regenerative agriculture agrees that there is a shift. There's a shift in the desire for a diverse movement, a movement that's intersectional, a movement that doesn't leave anyone out, um, and a movement that via its very nature brings up people who have been excluded, taken out, purposefully uh, you know, exploited in this. And, and, and look, we grow junk in the United States, monocrop junk. We grow garbage corn, garbage soy, and garbage wheat. And then we spray them with tremendous amounts of chemicals. And we, we subsidize grow, it. Yeah, we grow a monocrop of crops and we have a monocrop of people growing that monocrop of crops. <laughs> so obviously, you know, we can't just fix the crops. We got to fix the human issue too. And look, I think we've learned a lot since making the movie. Um, we've had a lot of deep discussions and we're, we're excited to dive into this issue in a way that, uh, that I think is really going to bring to light a lot of the injustices that have happened in agriculture. So, you know, first of all, thank you for the comment. Uh, thank you for your comments on social media. Those of you who've been very vociferous about this issue, mm -hmm. uh, you are heard. Uh, we have we have definitely you know done a lot of research, a lot of interviews, and and done a lot of humbling uh, conversations around this. So, and you you all have our word that the future films are going to be uh, vastly more representative on that issue. Yeah. yeah. And I think we were also a little bit surprised in this process when we first got the footage in, and we were looking at all of the farmers. I mean, they were all white men, all of them. I mean, when we went over the last seven years to take a snapshot of America and agriculture, what you see in Kiss the Ground is a real slice of what that life has looked like. And I think 
um, it's obvious that it's time for a change and the whole system is broken. So what a perfect moment to reinvent our food system and make sure that everyone is represented and treated fairly and to fix where we've broken it in the past. Thanks. And I, I hope uh, when you do the uh, sequels and uh, you come to Puerto Rico, I can definitely direct you to a few uh, female farmers uh, that are doing great stuff, especially after Hurricane Maria. There's a, a whole movement around this. And I would say uh, it's led for the most part by, uh, by women. So, um, so that, that's great, you know, and uh, future is female, definitely also in this field. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, Mary or Ryland also wanted to, uh, to comment on this. Mary? Um, uh, go yeah, ahead, Ryland. Go for it, Mary. <laughs> okay, um, I, I just wanted to add to that, that this is such a great parallel conversation, I think, for Kiss the Ground and Sierra Club to be having together because the environmental movement is also, I think, experiencing a, hopefully a moment of productive reflection around how people of color and people from marginalized communities have not felt always welcome in, in the environmental movement. And I, I hope that, I hope that this is the start of a really big change in, in both agriculture and environmentalism. And I think that we can, we can learn from each other as we go through this change, so. I see reasons for positivity. <laughs> yeah, I'll just I'll just um, add one last thing, which is just that uh, I'm hopeful that regenerative agriculture can be the movement that really does create social and environmental change together, and that it's a real beautiful moment where because a lot of the philosophy and worldview of regenerative agriculture is coming from an indigenous perspective, um, that it is the movement that can really uplift and inspire, you know, all of us coming together and um, that it really holds that possibility and um, that I'm hopeful for. I mean, nature is diverse. Nature, when it works and it's, when it's thriving, is diverse. And I think humans, when we're thriving, we are really in, in sync and, and you know, really in harmony in our diversity as a species. That's where we're going to thrive. And I guess I'd just like to add that one thing I would really look forward to, Josh, Rebecca, and Ryland in your future work is, is seeing a real celebration of the successes that exist among a diverse community of farmers. Um, even if they're not always so visible, there are many successes to celebrate and I, I look forward to hearing more about those. We look forward to sharing those conversations. We're having a lot of conversations right now. We're working on the next follow-up films about soil. Here we are now, and we're on our second film that we're working on about soil. This is your fault, Ryland. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, um, go, go, go. But wow. I think I think it's safe to say that we're really diving into this issue. We're really committed Great. to this issue. Yeah. Thanks. It's definitely appreciated, and uh, definitely. A, a lot of uh, movement or comments in the in the uh, Facebook uh, chat up around it. Yeah, uh, one, one more person that I'd just love to bring in. Um, we we just had a new board member join Kiss the Ground, the organization. A woman, amazing woman named Kara Boyd, and her husband is a, a gentleman by the name of John Boyd, who's been a civil rights activist and black farmer from Virginia, who's really been fighting for the rights of black farmers uh, in the face of discrimination from the USDA over the last you know, 25, 30 years. Um, and I just recently had him on my podcast and to hear the discrimination was appalling um, and, and you know, really like brought you know, a brick on my chest of that reality. Um, and just to follow John Boyd and the National Black Farmers Association and the work that they're doing to bring um, reform and rights and um, justice for black farmers and getting access back to um, getting black people on the land. Um, they're doing amazing work. So just wanted to bring him into the space and acknowledge his work. Thanks, uh, certainly. And uh, again, uh, if you want in your, for your podcast, some of the leading voices in Puerto Rico uh, from the movement, there are great examples. And it's, uh, it's uh, you know, the more you bring these stories, the more people can and the new generation can see it also as a as a as a model to follow 
and as a livelihood and as an option, you know, and uh, in Puerto Rico, we had the, uh, the idea that, you know, most farmers were old. And I would say that, you know, the vast majority, especially after the, after Hurricane Maria, uh, you know, it's young people, a uh, young woman leading this, uh, this, and it's, it's quite impressive. So I hope to, uh, to, uh, channel some of those uh, to your podcast, uh, Rylan. Uh, so continuing. That, that, would, that would be wonderful. Thank you, Ramon. All we'll, right. We'll, be, we'll follow up with that. Um, now, um, a few more questions. Uh, I want to know that, you know, we're getting on top of the hour, although we have uh, space to go over that, especially, you know, the president is letting us, like, you know, go over a uh, time uh, he finished his speech. So, uh, so, you know, we can stay a little longer if it's okay with everybody. Uh, and uh, I'll go through some of the questions from the audience. So one uh, quick, uh, can we produce enough food to meet demand using regenerative agriculture? Can I, I wanna just chime in here about this. I think I love this question because this, this really this really gets me i think this is so important that people understand the only way that we will have enough food to feed the world is through regenerative agriculture it is a huge myth to think that we can control nature and we can spray and you know modify our way out of the crisis that we're in that is doing more of what we've done that doesn't work will not fix the problem. It will only lead to the exact opposite, ironically, of what the promise is. So if we really want to look at how do we feed 7 billion or 10 billion people or however many people it's going to be, we really have to just completely stop the conversation that we've been on around the idea that this technology, this man-made technology will save us all. Because that is a myth that benefits people who are lining their pocketbooks, not one that benefits people who eat, food, eat food or who live on this earth. And so mm -hmm. that is a huge myth um, that we're also diving into right now. But I think it's really important for people to understand that there is a campaign to convince people that in order to feed the world, we have to use these practices that are rooted in, in colonialism and um, are monocrop and chemical based and not at all how we can actually increase our soil organic matter, increase our capacity to um, provide enough food for people to stave off these giant climatological disasters. And ultimately, I mean, when you have a regenerative system, that system is so abundant. That's the system where we can feed the world. And I imagine also like, you know, if you change that mentality together with that comes so many other things that are in line with that, you know, if I actually, we were talking before the, my previous panel, Jane Fonda, actually, she said she, she, she watched the movie. She loved it. Uh, one of the things, uh, the only comment actually that she, that she had was like, you know, the, in the, in the film, uh, they, they think that if you fix this or they portray as if they fix it, then you fix everything. <laughs> you know, and that's the, the climate solution. And, you know, we were talking, of course, the, the, the challenges of, of uh, putting, you know, everything that you want to, to say in just one film, you know. But, but I, do, I do think that, uh, you know, it's that mentality, uh, you know, aligns then with so many other things. And, and I was wondering as I, you know, that, that uh, the character, I mean, which is not fictional character, I guess is the reality of, of uh, Gabe Brown, I think is his name, right? So I, 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 I was always wondering, you know, well, where was he politically before? Where is he now? Where does he see the future? And also, you know, because I was checking his website and see how he charges, you know, nicely, I mean, and rightly so for giving conferences and everything. So there's a livelihood for him on that as well. But I wonder, you know, about that and how, uh, you know, is he and people like him in the wagon of, uh, of changing, making the political changes that needs to happen? 
uh, you know, and of course we cannot speak for him, but I wonder if uh, I well, just we, came we, up with we, that. And my apologies we, to the audience for uh, using, getting out of the facilitator mode and asking that question myself. Uh, well, Ramon, actually, it, it's, it's, it's kind of ironic that you're asking, not ironic, it's interesting because literally the first meeting of the House Agricultural Committee uh, for the House of Representatives um, this year was around agriculture, forestry, and climate and their connection. And they showed the Kiss the Ground film in the, um, in the committee meeting and Gabe Brown testified um, for you know, all, all these House of Repre you know members and really spoke to this essential, um, you know, this, this essential change that needs to take place. Um, and you know, this is obviously, this is um, within the new administration and speaking to this new administration with a lot of connectivity and hope of this is the future that we can, in the direction that we can go. Um, so G Gabe is, uh, you know, Gabe is, he's an, ama he's an amazing human being um, and he's totally on board. And uh, yeah, it, and, he's, and he's connected to, he knows that uh, the political system needs to support this change as well. And he's, he's supporting it, it to change. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Rylan. Let's see. Let's uh, let's go for a few more minutes. Uh, you know, I want. I promise, no more than uh, say ten minutes. So, uh, another question. Uh, let's see. Many studies uh, cited by regenerative agriculture proponents compare greenhouse gas heat trapping effects over time interval of hundred years. Which, uh, which dilutes the impact short of shorter lived methane. If a shorter time interval is used for calculations such as 20 or even 50 years, would the supposed climate benefits associated with regenerative style cattle grazing still remain? It's very technical. I don't know if anybody well, wants it, to. It, it's a critical question. The short answer is yes. Uh, so we could leave it at that. Or I could I could dive deeper. <laughs> Basically, we're talking about the difference. One minute. <laughs> yeah. Look, methane is what's called a flow gas. Carbon dioxide is what's called a stock gas. So methane is constantly uh, destroyed and moving through the what's called the biogenic cycle in the atmosphere. We have to remember before human beings industrialized the planet, we had far more room and it's far more four-legged animals on the planet than we do have today. So we have to go back to the question of why do we have increased methane value today as opposed to when we had more ruminants previously? And this is historical records. This is archaeological records. So the answer is very simple, human intervention. We squeeze these animals together. They don't move on the land. And we've got other sources of methane production, namely radical, radical high production of methane from rice fields and from fracking. So we have additional methane stocks that are not being reabsorbed into the biogenic cycle. A carbon dioxide, you cannot argue with. It is a stock gas. Over time, it accumulates in the atmosphere. It doesn't dissipate unless you have a physical sequestration of that gas. There has to be a biochemical exchange of which the oceans have done their best to absorb as much as possible. Trees have absorbed them as much as possible. So unless we create a biomechanical pump to move that carbon dioxide, the methane conversation is irrelevant because we will outstrip the amount of capacity for the planet's atmosphere to hold carbon dioxide and balance temperatures long before we deal with methane. And yes, methane is far more insulating than carbon dioxide, but you've only got one way to put that, you know, this is, this, is a, this is a binary issue. It's either too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere or it's the right amount. And the only way to get the right amount is to put it somewhere. So, you know, it, it's very simple. You need cows to do that. Will cows produce enteric methane? Yes, they produce far less when they grass finish and grass feed. There is growing evidence to show that there is bacteria that actually pulls the methane back, methanotrophs, into the biogenic cycle. Bottom line is, we have to do this. 
we have to pull the carbon dioxide out or the planet will not be a place that human beings can live. We have exactly one mechanism to do it. So yeah, we're gonna have to eventually deal with the fact that we've messed up the biogenic cycle, but that's not cows per se. That is massive amounts of fracking. That is massive amounts of rice generation. That is other sources of methane. And yes, the way we manage cows today produces excessive methane. The way we should be managing them produces a natural amount that's reabsorbed into the biogenic cycle. So. I mean, and also in a perfect world, wouldn't we take whatever the, like the native animal is to that region? Ideally, we would use whatever the native plants are, the native animals, and you would recreate the environment before human beings came in and interfered. And that's going to be the system that's going to have the most amount of drawdown. And the thing that I think surprised me the most in this process was learning that grasslands, as you've said, is by far the number one way to draw down and sequester carbon. You know, I would think that it would be a rainforest or it would be something like that, but to have, to build topsoil in that healthy soil, you need to have the presence of these grasses that co-evolved with ruminants. And ideally it would be whatever the ruminants were that were there before we came in, but we're talking about America here and in an industrialized food system. So I think that's why you speak primarily about cows, but in an ideal world, we would go back and it would look like it was for each region would have its own system that was really created for that that region based on what was there before. Um, well, you know, there's so many other great questions, you know, in the that I, I, unfortunately we don't have, you know, too much time. So I think we're going to be moving to closing, uh, you know, statements from the panel. But you know, there were questions about, uh, you know better integration in the curriculum of schools and university, uh, you know, and uh, uh, what about uh, the, the leadership in the agencies? And there were many, uh, you know, much opposition to Vilsack coming back as uh, a Secretary of Agriculture. I just watch and, the film, by the know. way. He just watched Kiss the Ground. What? And he said that he, he watched the movie. He did. And it was he a, he had a very positive reaction to it. And it was very promising. So we'll, we'll see how that pans out. And in response to the education, 100% from day one, our commitment was to make this film, but make it free for schools. So we have a 45 minute version of the film. Um, it does feature, it's different from the feature film that you see on Netflix. It has this beautiful sex, section on um, with, with Tony Ten Fingers. It talks about indigenous practices. Mm -hmm. It's not in the feature film. Um, we love the short educational version of the film. It's free. You can go to kissthegroundmovie.com. It's free for educators, students, schools, parents doing remote learning. Um, but it's 45 minutes long, and it's every it's all the highlights from Kiss the Ground plus a few extra fun things that people will really love. And it's available now all around the world. There are also uh, an educational curriculum that goes along with that that's being developed by the National Science Teaching Association that you can sign up for in time to receive um, for Earth Month that will be available. Okay, um, uh, great. Um, well, I'm, I'm very glad to, to hear that uh, that Biltek uh, watched the movie. He was Secretary of Agriculture by the time the French minister was trying to do that in uh, in in Paris, so uh, so hopefully this time around the U.S. can uh, can join that as well. Uh, let's see. So you know, let's move towards uh, uh, closing. Uh, if any of you would like to uh, to give some uh, closing remarks, leave us with some thought and more, of course, of the inspiration that you have transmitted to this uh, great film and and great work. But uh, please, I'll I'll leave. Uh, you know, probably Josh and Rebecca first, since uh, you may have the, what, four and 6.9 year old, maybe. Uh, <laughs> That's good. On your door. So, uh, so yeah, so please go ahead. I mean, for me, it's just, I'm just so, I'm so deeply honored and grateful to have been a part of this project to learn that there is hope and that, you know, if we can overcome all of our differences and, you know, not get stuck, you know, arguing over, um, over data that's actually insignificant in the big picture of things. I feel tremendous hope for what's possible for humanity. And I do with all my heart know that regenerative agriculture is the pathway forward for that. 
Yeah, I would, I would absolutely second that. And you know, look, the, we've been, we as an environmental movement, we've been discussing the Gaia theory of a, you know, mass biological, if not consciousness, at least awareness that the planet is and represents for 50 years now. And I think it's time for us to realize that humanity has been managing planet Earth. We've been driving it like uh, somebody who's blindfolded and drunk and driving the car backwards uh, by using the rearview mirror. Uh, that's exactly how we've been managing planet Earth. So I, I think it is, I think it is time for us as an ecology movement, an environmental movement, a green movement, to take the blindfold off put our hands on the steering wheel and accept responsibility that we are in a constant co-creation with a living, possibly aware, at least very reactive biological system. And we now have the science, we have the tools and we have the data to be able to restore that ecosystem and to co-create with that ecosystem a, an abundant future that will provide food for every living human being and that will provide balance for the creatures and life forms on this planet. But we're going to have to manage that like participants, not like we're blind, not like we don't care and, and not like it's just happening. Uh, and that's the opportunity that we have to regenerate earth. So I'm excited to, uh, to have that conversation with the Sierra Club. I'm excited you all are participating and I can't wait to see this next chapter of the environmental movement. I think it's gonna be Beautiful. Thanks a lot. Uh, okay, Ryland and Mary in three minutes. Ryland. Uh, yeah, wonderful. Yeah, just thank you, Ramon. Thank you, Sierra Club, for this amazing opportunity and for championing regenerative agriculture. It's definitely a dream come true to be here and to be um, standing at a place when regeneration as a context for humans on planet Earth is becoming uh, a, a more known reality and a more more known possibility um you know kiss the ground the organization really is doing our best to become a hub and an education center for any and everyone um in the world to get resourced and understanding about how they as an individual can participate in the regenerative movement so please um you know come check out kisstheground.com and um you know follow our social media threads there's a ton of information we're putting out and then you know really our our, our big uh, call to action is getting people to become soil advocates. Um, we have an amazing course designed for people to become, uh, you know, the cavalry that can um, be the voice uh, that really champions uh, this tipping point to continue to go in the direction that it's going. So um, really join our community. And um, yeah, it's really an honor to be in partnership. And I look forward to more partnerships with uh, the CR Club uh, in the future. And thank you, Mary, and thank you, Josh and Rebecca, for being here. And thanks, Josh and Rebecca, for being amazing partners and amazing filmmakers and making this beautiful vision come true. Thanks, Rylan. And Mary, you may have uh, different <laughs> points you wanted to uh, intervene before. My apologies. You... No, um, I, I did want to mention one thing when we were talking about what people can do at home to participate in the regenerative movement. Even if you aren't able to regeneratively grow your own food, planting native plants, planting insect habitat, planting native perennials, trees, that is also part of ecosystem regeneration. And I think it's a really valuable contribution. So if you don't have room for a lemon tree, plant a manzanita bush um, or something else um, that's, that's suitable for your local ecosystem. And I also just wanna share, I know Sierra Club people tend to be really interested in policy advocacy. Um, I think there's just some really hopeful examples across the US of policy that is progressing, that supports healthy soils. California has some great climate smart um, agricultural uh, policies. They're being echoed in states across the country. Um, and I, I think that's a great momentum that we're seeing. And I think Sierra Club has a, has a lot of excitement toward continuing to work on this topic. We've been joining and learning from other organizations like the Four Per Thousand Initiative and I would just encourage everyone to look at the local level of Sierra Club where you are and encourage your local chapter to start getting involved in agricultural issues and see how agriculture and the environment can be a partnership and can work together for positive change, um, not, not necessarily as adversaries. So um, 
Yeah, we as the Sierra Club have an important role to play here in uh, the Agriculture Environment Connection. And I'm so glad we got to have this fabulous conversation with, uh, with our partners. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mary. And, and thanks to all of you, all the panelists and everybody who was with us in the next, uh, the last hour and 15 minutes, you know, thanks for joining. Let's continue this conversation and please join, uh, you know, the Food and Agriculture Grassroots Network team uh, at the Sierra Club. If you have an interest to engage within your community, uh, please do so. We will be following up with an invitation to join and hope many of our Sierra Club chapters will engage in this grassroots effort to, to help connect farmers with communities in need. So, uh, so yeah, thanks so much uh, for everything and, uh, and uh, hope to see you all soon, hopefully in person, get uh, vaccinated, take care of, your, of all of you and, um, and yeah, we'll see each other soon. I need so some much. regeneratively grown vegetables. Yes. yes. Thank yeah, actually, Thank you, one, everybody final, watching. One, final, one final note is there's an amazing map called uh, from Regeneration International. They made a map of all the regenerative farms across the country and even globally. Um, you can find it at kisstheground.com or Regeneration International. Um, but it's an amazing way to start eating, you know, a few ingredients that are coming from regeneratively um, sourced uh, farms and ranches. So check that out. And uh, yeah, thank you, everyone. It's been a beautiful night. <laughs>